Okay, thanks for the recording. Um, and uh, the, the volunteer, you know, just uh, can quit, leave, or, you know, find another organization, or, uh, you know, just disappear for a week because he or she is unsatisfied, and, and so on and so forth. And the last thing about anticipation is when you uh, notice um, behavior or a code of conduct, which is not, uh, let's say, uh, to the codex of the organization, to the laws and, and, and everything that requires, you know, like a decent, let's say, in uh, uh, law abiding behavior, I can, I can um, say. Uh, so this is a pretty much, you know, a situation when the volunteer is involved or experienced like a, a criminal offense, as we mentioned, uh, maybe a robbery, maybe a harassment, maybe a fight. Uh, so that is a clear, clear situation of um, you know, of potential crisis happen. Um, in a nutshell, these are the 10 points that we selected for uh, anticipation and the, uh, for the production. Yes, I would like to suggest something. Sorry, Marian. Yeah. I would like to suggest something. So now I will like really to hear from the other partners what they think for this uh, on this topic, what are their experiences. And later, maybe at 10 uh, a.m. to have a, a break, uh, Michaela. And later, Marian, to continue with the with the presentation and with the group work that we're gonna have. What do you think, okay. guys? So basically, yeah. yes. After this part, or after this part that Marian presented, uh, what are your opinions? What are your experience? Do you have anything to share? What are some of the prevention methods that maybe you already use? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, so thank you, Rosica, for uh, giving us the space uh, to say some stuff. So for me, it was very interesting um, uh, what uh, Marianne was mentioning, uh, this thing about daily communication with the volunteer. Like uh, maybe it's only my case, but I have really this laissez-faire or how to pronounce this, like very like... Uh, when we send the volunteer abroad, I, I have a feeling that I would like the, let the volunteer to be kind of free and not to disturb. I have a feeling I'm disturbing the volunteer if I'm asking him how is he or she doing. And I'm fine with the situation if the volunteer write me only if there is some problem or some crisis. I understand. Maybe it's because my volunteering was like this and I find it okay. Like I have a space to... No, grow to discover the country and I will not be in touch with sending organization on daily basis or something like that like what they want to know they want to follow I'm not a, a child in kindergarten or something like that so this is what I do with volunteers that I send that the communication is not really on daily basis but what Marianne uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, make me uh, quite curious because at the moment I host two volunteers from Georgia and there is a big uh, cultural difference in the sense of a relationship between sending organization and the volunteer. Like, I was quite shocked that my volunteers who are here for one year, they are in daily touch with the sending coordinator. I absolutely don't understand this. And I had a call with the sending organization only because we had some big crisis, of course. And uh, then he told me, Andre, you know, uh, sending Georgian volunteer to you, it's like I need to ask their fathers for permission. It's, it's like he, he told me we are like a village. I, I mean, he was, you know, like it's a really cultural difference. Like, like we in Georgia are so close to each other. If I don't tell their fathers like where they are going, what will they do there that I assure their security and safety, uh, they will not let them go. Like even though they are 25 or something like that. And then... Every day they, they write to each other some messages, what they did, how are they doing. I cannot imagine this with my organ, with my volunteer that I sent. It's so much more liberal. So I now what Maria mentioned, it reminds me if, if Macedonia is similar like Georgia in this way, or they told me, yes, like uh, maybe Caucasus, Balkan, South Italy, they mentioned that some places are more like people are more close to each other and even sending volunteer is like you send a family member. I, I, I really don't understand this, but we don't it's do It's almost this. like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but really in the first edition of Eurasia, so you know that we had three volunteers in Asia. So basically 
okay, it, it wasn't on a daily basis. It was on a daily basis only with the girl who had the mental health issues. So uh, the other two, the, the, the volunteers, we, we were just being in touch with them just to ask them, is it everything okay? How we are dealing with the task? How we are dealing with the environment? So basically in our culture and in our relationship, how to say Macedonia is a way to, to show that you're caring you know, for, for, for them. That the, and not to leave a space to for them to feel that they're all alone there, you know. So uh, maybe that's that is a, that is connected with the culture differences. Yeah. Uh, however, I, yes. If I and can add, it, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Go ahead. No, I, I want to say to to Andre and and you, Rosika, that maybe it's easier when you send, I say, five or ten volunteers to ask them every day. Yeah. At Addis. Uh, I can be in charge of 30, 40 volunteers at the same time. I, I don't have time to ask them every day how they're going because otherwise I would be only doing that. And when you ask someone, how are you? You have to expect, um, you have to listen. We talked about co good communication. If someone is telling you there's something wrong or there's something I'm proud of, then you have to take this in consideration. But uh, at sure. Addis, we, we, we do... Uh, send them there's an automatic questionnaire uh, sending it every month and it's because we um we are in charge it's not that we'd want to see a problem everywhere but we need to mentor um their progress and uh, we all know that you know the their mood can switch and when they have difficult moments it's very important for 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 us to to say look at the second month or at the third month, you said you were really proud of that or you said you had difficulties and now you, you, you do that very easily. So it's for us to have um, uh, really to, to encourage them and for them to see their progress. So when they come back, um, because we focus a lot of, um, you know, going back to the labor market after their volunteering. So we, we need to see and they need to, to see, to realize the progress they've made. So we don't ask only what is going wrong, but what is going right also. But uh, again, this has to be, you know, with tools and with a good team because, yes, you, you, you can tell the parents that it's going well every day or <laughs> but when, when you have 10 maximum, I guess, volunteers. Yeah, I think that you need a chatbot. <laughs> well, this can go wrong as well, as well you know you need a chance yeah uh, it depends can, I, actually, this can i say something yeah please Daniel. Uh, th thank you very much uh Cyril. i i think i'm uh, i hope I'm, I'm saying your name right um i think it's very interesting what you said and would it be possible for you to share a draft of this uh, uh questionnaire that you are sending to the volunteers that you send of course i will put it uh, in the drive because what, what we do generally, we, we keep contact with the volunteers that we send uh, on a monthly basis as well, more or less. Uh, of course, uh, if there are no specific difficult or um, potential crisis cases. But yeah, we generally send an email. So the, uh, my colleague is sending an email asking how is the situation, if they can update with us uh on the process some of them are getting back uh, but then we have the same situation that we were mentioning yesterday in one of the workshops that there are some volunteers who uh to whom that question is enough to write you an email of two pages to detail and add pictures or add the link to their blog, personal blog or there are volunteers who just answer everything is going fine <laughs> or volunteers who are just ignoring the email for two, three months in a row. And then we step in and try to try to understand. But as long as they know we are here. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. And at the same time, we work, we do the same with the, with the hosting organizations. So I try to do it on a monthly basis. Sometimes I don't manage if it's, it's a lot of uh, workload, but we try as well to, um, to have the, 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 the feedback from the host organization, especially in, as an anticipation of, of some conflict uh, problems or conflict situation that might, might happen so that we are aware if something is not going 
properly as it's and is is it was planned to be. And we often ask the hosting organizations as well to um, to share with us some dissemination elements, some dissemination materials like pictures, videos, or products that are made by the volunteer uh, with together with the hosting organization so that we can as well follow and can disseminate as well. Yeah, actually, this is quite interesting because now I can see the cultural and traditional background about the approach. Uh, for example, we are more tight, I guess, because that's like this, um, let's say, um, obsessive parents love that uh, we, we have in the region or in Georgia. I think that uh, um, in that way, as Andre mentioned, like family, we treat them as family members, but also it's true that we have not 40 volunteers, like we have maybe six or seven to 10 volunteers up to, um, up to one year, which it can be handled. But also uh, in Macedonia, for example, you have this uh, family moment or the family background. Uh, for example, I remember, to correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, some of the uh, people who were interviewed for the volunteers, one of the girls came with her mother uh, and another came with the family. So uh, meaning, you know, that they really want to know where the uh, child from 25 years goes. And they want, you know, to, to be clear and to be sure that nothing, uh, you know, bad will happen. So that in a way... It is also <laughs> worth to mention, it is also worth to mention yeah. that uh, in our reality, the young people uh, don't have a lot of opportunities to travel in Asia. So I'm speaking specifically for this project. So basically, when we are sending uh, regular uh, EVS volunteers, for example, in Mladin for Slovakia, we surely for a one year of service. So we surely do not communicate with them every second day. So basically uh, this, uh, we, we were speaking most specifically for this type of pro pro project because the young people from Macedonia had uh, more chances to travel to Europe. So the surrounding is very closer to them. They can easily more be adapted to the uh, culture in Europe. So, but in Asia, so it's a pretty tricky thing for them. So uh, that's why I mentioned that in this project, we are maybe uh, more oftenly uh, in communication with the volunteers, but not in the other project. It also depends, of course, of the duration of the service. If the volunteer is somewhere for 12 months, of course, that I won't bother them like every second day. But um, in Eurasia, in the previous edition, the volunteers were for two months and a half, as I around 45 days, something like that. So basically we assume that the adaptation of uh, the life there, it will be more difficult if they went to Slovakia. So basically that's why we wanted, how to say, to establish a good connection and to make good connection. So they will be free to tell us everything, how they feel, what they want to do. So, and maybe potentially to avoid some, some type of crisis. Yeah, but also this goes a step further for us because, I mean, this is our approach. You have different approach. So, again, Daniela, you have a different approach and Cyril, I guess it's the correct name. Uh, you have different approach. Andre has different approach for us. For example, uh, some of the volunteers who went abroad, they afterwards became employees of, of uh, Mladinfo. Uh, so we were in touch. They did a really good job there. We saw that they're, you know, like quality, beautiful young people. And when they come back, we had an open position that we offered to them. So that was the connection that we established with the volunteers. And again, I guess this goes uh, for uh, having, uh, you know, uh, around maybe maximum to 10 volunteers per year where you have 40, it's completely understandable that you need to be, uh, you know, more efficient with your time and efficient with the communication. Uh, so um, thanks for this session of sharing. I, I would really like to, when we are doing this uh, crisis uh, management plan, I really like to have you know your feedback so we can have like different approaches uh, to, to the situation. And when we distribute to other organizations, they can find themselves and maybe you know um, enhance their mechanisms for, for, for crisis management. May I add something, uh, Marian? Yes, Anita. Uh... I was uh, EVS volunteer 13 years ago in Spain and on the on arrival meeting, we were like 200 volunteers who were at the same time in Spain. Uh, so uh, 
it was not uh, some statistical uh, uh, record, but uh, most of uh, the volunteers from the South were um, with the Finnish uh, university and uh, those from the uh, North, from the Scandinavian countries, they were uh, not enrolled uh, still in the university. They were 18, uh, 19, and uh, they went uh, to uh, EVS to decide what they want to study. Uh, but uh, those from the South uh, finished the university and it was like a, a internship, a kind of internship for them, for, um, for their profession. So uh, very depends of the age of the volunteers, uh, the treatment uh, we will have. Those who uh, are with uh, finished university, we consider that are uh, more adult and they can uh, uh, make better de decisions, not, not a rule, but uh, uh, from those uh, who are 18, for example. Mm, I will say again, it's not a rule, but uh, the age can be um, uh, taken into consideration when uh, uh, planning uh, the crisis management. Thank you, Anita. Anyone else? Anyone else wants to share before we go on the break? If I can just very shortly, I'm I'm so curious about this uh, cultural differences uh, here, even among the European partners. It's crazy. Like when I had 18 year old volunteer from France, from uh, like die, um, like the family, the mother was not living with the father, they were divorced. I asked her, how often do you communicate with your parents? Well, I don't know, once a week or even less. And my Georgian volunteer, who is like 23, when she wake up, she first called the mom, you know, it's like every day, not once, like several times, like her mom is doing EVS with her, like she's from morning till evening, during the day, like all the time, not only mom, the cousins, parents, friends, like nephews, animals, like it's, it's, she is here with all her family, but okay, she's first time abroad, you know, but, but the, the family ties, it's amazing. They really, they told me, Balkan or some South Spain, South Italy, like Sicily or something. I don't know. They mentioned some examples. Like I never saw such a family relationship in compared to this Western European individualist, uh, Austrian 18 year old. We are independent. I travel all the world already with my family for holidays. Now I'm finally alone. They don't want to hear about their parents. They want to enjoy the country. It's, it's so different. Like I'm, I'm still, Shocked. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Andre. I think we can have a break right now. Oh, let's uh, meet up again 10.15 okay. and, and continue with the presentation. Okay. Okay, see you then, guys. Um, we already mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we already mentioned this a bit at the, at the beginning of my slides, but now I want to go uh, a bit in deep about two most important things of the sending and two most important things of the hosting organization. Of course, um, this is something that uh, we define as such. We would really love to he hear your experience and feedback uh, once again, because we, can all, we all know that we have some differences in handling the situations. Um, so, um, the the probably the first thing uh, uh, with uh, which is the most important one from from this part is the individual interview as part of this uh, prevention mechanism methods meaning that uh, the individual interviews with the volunteers should be taken seriously and uh, you know should be a top priority for your organization uh, when dealing with the with the volunteers um as i mentioned i mean you uh, you are not um, just uh, you are not uh, receiving an employee, but you have, let's say, more responsibility of that because you are sending or you're hosting uh, a person outside of their comfort zone, uh, let's, uh, let's assume. Uh, so uh, the, individual, the individual interviews, uh, we, we tend to have them in a really relaxed atmosphere, nothing formal, 
uh, not really like a tight questions of, uh, or, you know, predefined questions. Of course, we have some questions in our mind, but we just let, uh, you know, we go with the flow when we talked, uh, let's say more openly, more intimately with the volunteer in order to get uh, as much as information um, as we can. Um, so, uh, uh, we try to to establish a, a really a comfortable and confident atmosphere for the all, all volunteers and we don't go usually like through their CV one by one or to the uh, you know motivation ladder but we try to to you know to have a regular conversation um, so uh, it's really important besides you know the motivation of uh, why the volunteer wants to go um, to to you know to to the service uh, what is uh, the motivation, what it can bring what, uh, for, for him or her, uh, what are the benefits for the organization. We uh, try to uh, pose very discreetly and, um, you know, in really, um, yeah, in really subtle ways some questions that uh, maybe we can predefine some potential, let's say, crisis. For example, um, if the person has some kind of health problems, like chronic problems, uh, some kind of allergies, like medical situation. Uh, sometimes we tend to also uh, ask a personal questions about uh, uh, previous problems with the law and everything that actually can be posted in a regular interview, for example, when you go to uh, get a job in an organization. And I'm take, taking OSCE, uh, for, ex for example, in the OSC, when you apply, you have a lot of stuff that you need to you know, tick the box and say like you are convicted, not and so on and so forth. But we do this in a more friendly and in informal way in order to get as uh, much as information uh, as we can, so we can know what to expect. For example, if somebody has a, um, let's say, chronic uh, disease, and we see that the placement is not fit for that kind of uh, situation, then we tend not to choose the volunteer. So this is not a discrimination, uh, let's say, based on that, but this is, uh, you know, thinking of the best for the volunteer and the organization in order to prevent some unpleasant situation. Uh, here I might say the, the uh, probably the, the ethical and the privacy uh, line is quite, uh, you know, thin, uh, but we, uh, we, between our experience uh, until now, we didn't have any uh, kind of, let's say, objections or some kind of issues when we have an interview with the uh, with the volunteer. Uh, so uh, basically, we, in a nutshell, we go in deep, like uh, feelings, emotions, previous, uh, you know, experience, health, and everything which is more private for the for the volunteer. Um, also, I mentioned um, here uh, the the sending organization, or in our case, some sometimes we work with the uh, with the family. We are touching the family. Uh, also, because I mentioned uh, part of the volunteers uh, come with their parents to the interview. I mean, they drive them, they wait them in the hallway, and so on and so forth. So we we have this additional pressure of uh, of having the family at our back. So uh, we need to communicate. Um, uh, to communicate the, with them every information about the possible uh, placement. I guess maybe in France or Slovakia or Italy, the situation is quite different, but this is our experience. I really find it, uh, you know, quite interesting uh, uh, in, in this point. Um, the next thing, uh, Rosice, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, the next thing is, uh, as we already talked in the previous days, also is preparing the volunteer. Uh, so, um, of course, the, the, we organize pre-departure session, as I mentioned, uh, but also uh, we try to uh, to be very precise with the rights and, and the obligations of the volunteer. And uh, for this crisis situation, we need to inform the volunteer what uh, he or she how need, needs to react in certain crises and what is expected from the host organization on the sending organization. Uh, so based on our communication with the partners beforehand, uh, we already uh, know the conditions, for example, the, the accommodation, uh, what is the restrictions, maybe now the COVID measures, what is the dress code, the cultural um, experience, the cultural barriers. So we need to communicate to communicate this with the volunteer in order to prepare, but most importantly is that um, every time before sending and receiving volunteer, uh, we inform them about uh, crisis situation. So uh, we say, okay, this is the person that you need to uh, contact if you have a trouble, 
Uh, the first step is to contact them. Second step, for example, is to contact us. If you have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, criminal activity, if you got robbed, then you need to call the police. So we provide the numbers of the uh, of the hosting country. We provide their personal numbers. So basically, everything that the volunteer uh, needs to feel uh, more safe uh, in the in the uh, some of the situations. Uh, of course, we don't tackle all of the situations. We go in general about um, what can happen and uh, who, whom to reach out. But we present some kind of uh, cases and situations that we have in the past. Uh, so the volunteers can know, for example, a real life situation that can uh, happen to them. This is not just to scare them, but uh, to, in order to, um, to make them to feel more responsible about their own actions, because um, in a way, they're grown-ups, they're adults who, um, who you know, uh, they have their own responsibility for the safety, they have responsibility to uh, perform well, but in the end, we provide them uh, the support. Uh, also, uh, as part of this pre-orientation session, we go with some uh, general information, for example, about uh, medical information, hospitals, uh, you know, advices of, um, you know, like unwanted pregnancy, disease, or some kind of uh, situation that can happen uh, with some uh, suggestions and advices, as I mentioned, like a phone, telephones that they can uh, reach out if, if something of this happens. Um, for the hosting organization, the two most important things that we, uh, we, we need uh, to consider are this orientation from the other side upon arrival in, uh, of, the, of the volunteer and preparation by the tutor or the mentor. Um, this for us is uh, also really important because the tutor is the key person who will be uh, in charge of the volunteer. Of course, that you can have uh, different roles, for example, tutor, mentor, then you have supervisor, then a project coordinator, and the hierarchy of the organization. But the person who is uh, more or less 24 hours available needs to know a lot about the volunteer. So meaning uh, those things that we discuss, like change of behavior, uh, you know, like criminal activity, uh, some kind of behavior which is outside of the code of conduct, the tutor needs to be um, capable and skilled to recognize and uh, to report to the uh, to the rest of the team and the uh, and the sending organization. Um, for this, uh, in our organization, we have um, this practice of sharing. Uh, so when we have a volunteer or when we send a volunteer, we tend all to go to these orientation sessions, to go to the meetings, to get to know uh, each other. But also, we need to know uh, how to re react in a crisis situation. Uh, now, um, for example, Rosica and the other colleagues are more involved, they are directly involved with the uh, volunteers, but for example, um, I have all the information in our organization uh, about uh, the volunteer, the organization, and how to react if potential crisis happen. Uh, so basically transfer of information in all levels, like horizontal and, 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 and vertical, but again, uh, the role of the, of the tutor or the mentor is the most uh, important one. Um, I don't know uh, in your case, but uh, some of the national agencies, they are providing trainings uh, for tutors and mentors for, uh, for the volunteers. Uh, in, our, uh, in our country, like these trainings are not very common, but not by the national agency as such, uh, but also some non-governmental organizations are doing trainings or preparing uh, tutors and, and mentors, which we find quite beneficial because uh, it is an atmosphere like this training when we share and we learn um, you know, uh, from from the uh, from the others uh, examples. Um, so yeah, I will not go in deep in this. We will have a bit of conversation. Uh, and the last thing about the hosting organization is the constant support and monitoring. Uh, again, the role of the tutor and the mentor is or the mentor is the most important one here. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, we need. Uh, we need to establish a monitoring system, uh, not only about their performance at work, but also to, uh, to you know, to monitor their behavior as uh, the, the, the service is progressing. Uh, so, um, uh, for example, always we have for a second contact person or a reserve person, just in case if the tutor or the mentor is involved in the crisis. For example, I'm saying now like the mentor and the volunteer were driving and they had car accident. So we need, we always have a backup person who is uh, in charge of taking over um, and managing, uh, and managing the, the crisis. 
Um, so this is pretty much it from uh, from my part. Um, now Rosica will uh, will guide you to the next step when uh, where we want to discuss more in depth about, about this yes. prevention methods and methodology. Thank you, Marian. Thank you. So guys, uh, we put only two most important things uh, for the sending and for the hosting organization, but we want to hear from you because there are plenty of more probably elements that are important uh, when a prevention uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, when prevention should be defined and worked on. So we'd like to ask you to go again on the Jamboard. Mishka will, um, Mihaela will, uh, uh, create three breakout rooms. So we will be divided in three groups. On the Jamboard, you have um, three slides, group one, group two, group three, with the same question. Uh, you, you are invited to discuss in between the members of the group that you're gonna be uh, automatically divided probably. So uh, discuss what are your ideas for prevention methods, uh, methods and most important things to avoid crisis. So, um, I was in the group one with Daniela, Orman, and Veronica, so I, I will divine, invite some of them to share a little bit what we have discussed and what we think that there are important things uh, to consider and in order to avoid crisis. So, Veronica, Daniela, Orm, you can start whoever wants. Okay, for I can, okay. I can start. Um, so we were um, starting the conversation um, discussing about one of the main uh, key elements to uh, have a proper prevention uh, could be to have a very clear communication and information for, and communication between the hosting and the sending organization of that specific uh, volunteering project. As, uh, as much information we, we give and we get, uh, as much we can reduce the risk of, of, of a conflict or, or of a difficult situation that might, uh, might happen. Um, I was pointing out that um, I think it's very uh, relevant. Generally, it's always relevant, but in this case, which uh, when the, there is a, as well a, a lot of cultural diversity between Europe and, and Asian countries, uh, it would be very relevant and very important to uh, focus the uh, attention on the uh, on what we might think are minor details, but might be very relevant for the other part. So let's try to give as many information about small details, like how the accommodation would look like. It, will it be a, a hosting family or, or or a shared flat? How the how is life? What is considered uh, socially acceptable to do and what is not? And um, I was just saying, let's imagine that there is an alien coming to our own country. So we need to explain every, everything starting from the rules. Uh, don't give information and things for, 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 for granted. And this is a, a, a comment that I'm doing to, to myself as well. So let's, let's try to, uh, to share as much as possible. It would be very nice if the hosting and the sending organization could share as well some videos, some live streaming, so that actually volunteers can have a first eye impact, a first uh, eye uh, image of how is the local reality. As uh, Roshitsa said, it's very important that uh, we know um, how the, the place will, will look like, how what is considered uh, good and uh, which are the do's and the don'ts. Um, but yeah, let's try to be very, very transparent in uh, uh, sharing. And of course, between the hosting organization and the volunteer, there should be an open communication, constant open communication. And uh, just last thing, um, and I'm just reading here now. Um, yeah, personal information, safety, and and clear idea of the tasks. Yeah. So because sometimes the uh, the, the project uh, description uh, online or on the paper could be something, but it's very important to have a, a, a real update, especially now we are after COVID situation. So what is doable and what is not. And I don't know if Veronica or Orm want to add uh, something. I think you mentioned everything pretty well. I would only, Thank you. I would only add uh, something that I uh, mentioned on our discussion. So basically, uh, in my opinion, the hosting organization 
is the number one provider before the departure of the volunteer on the arrival and during the whole stay of the service on the volunteer. So even if some of the information, practical information are not shared upfront before the volunteer goes, uh, it is their responsibility to, to inform them constantly for the things uh, that the volunteer should do not do. For example, don't go in this area, don't travel with a, I don't know, tuk-tuk, how are the cars named in Thailand or whatever. Uh, I don't know, watch out, the taxi uh, guy will rob you. So uh, all of those stuff that we cannot even find it on the Google, what are like best tips for traveling, uh, uh, are, all, are important. Uh, for example, I know that uh, uh, somebody mentioned me a couple of years ago that there are areas in Paris where actually it's not recommendable a girl to go alone after midnight. So those, all of those informations are very important for the volunteers. So uh, not only before they went on the service, but also during the stay. So uh, the hosting organization is seeing the behavior uh, of the volunteer, constantly monitoring it. So it is up their responsibility to them to update them on every information and advise them uh, what to do, what to not to do. So this is from our group. Um, I will move the slide to the second one. And I don't know who was in the second group. You can start by sharing how was your discussion. I think we, we merged the, the stickers from the two groups by accident. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I think so. From the group two and from the group three. Or no. Okay. No, because I, I wrote like four stickers. Now we have six. Maybe someone added. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Marian, don't worry. I wrote also something. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Andre knows everything. <laughs> okay, Andre. Thanks. So, so the second group was share? actually Marian, uh, Andre, and Cyril and Trang. So any one of you who could share? Uh, okay, I'll go for it. Um, we, we talked about shortly again about the questionnaires, and we we talk about you know how you know not to push too much, but still have keep a good communication uh, with the volunteer and the host organization um, in order to, yeah, to, to prevent um, any, any major crisis. crisis. Um, but again, it's difficult because a crisis is also something very sudden. Um, so we thought, um, Trang thought that maybe in the partnership agreements, uh, some key um, information should be put like, the emergency contact, and also the I added the insurance number uh, because you know sometimes with the sending organization and the hosting there is a time differences and um, in a crisis you need to react quickly so sometimes uh, maybe the host organization can can call the emergency contact or the insurance number. Of course, there is a language barrier, but um, sometimes it's better to to save um, time by trying. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they mentioned a, a, a guide um, that we created at ADIS. Um, it sounds like a promotion for me, but uh, we, I, I think um, uh, my colleague Charlotte will talk to you about this tomorrow, but it is ac uh, has free access and it is in English if you, if you want to use it. Um, but the thing that I, I, re I wanted to mention um, is that Trang um, said that perhaps in the partnership agreement, um, we can have like a list of possible crises. It, it is difficult because we, we, we saw that with the pandemic that it is difficult to think about every crisis, of course, but perhaps if we can agree on the, um, the process, how we want to react. Um, and so it's not, uh, you know, when the crisis happened, it's not like, okay, so what do we do now? If we have already discussed it, um, yeah, perhaps it would go quicker. Anything else, guys, you want to add from our group? 
Uh, uh, no, actually, I just want to finish my thought because I was interrupted by uh, lack of time. Um, Trunk suggested uh, to have um, this, let's say, common rules of action if crisis happens. And basically, this is the aim of the session that uh, as an outcome, we want to have uh, this crisis management plan that will be jointly created by all of us and they, it can be used in crisis management situations. So basically to know what to do, how and, and when if something happens. Uh, so we can include this in the drive and we can use it as, as the document. So I will move to the third, I will move to the third group. So probably Mishka, Elishka, Mishka, Elishka. <laughs> and I don't know, Anita, Jennifer. Yeah. I can uh, summarize it, guys, if you, if you want. Yeah. Uh, you can always uh, like uh, say something more. So uh, we were talking that we can connect uh, the ex volunteers from the edition one to the new uh, future volunteers to encourage them to share peer to peer, you know, their, their experience, because also many things we might not even know what happened, you know, in their heads and in their life, because not everything perhaps they shared, but they will share it within each other as a friend to a friend. Uh, also, uh, we should have like some quality, uh, pretty departure, yeah, to invest a lot of time in it. Uh, uh, Anita was mentioning that we should do some uh, like quality risk analysis and maybe based on that we can do some small simulations with the, with the future volunteers, for example. What would you do if uh, there's no electricity for two days or what would you do? How would you feel if there you have some racist comment on the street uh, or something like this? And also to think about it during the selection process when we would uh, talk uh, on Skype or in person with some uh, potential candidates for the volunteering mobility to already tell them that uh, there might be some problems that can happen. We can uh, make like a list few of them and then uh, the candidates would uh, actually have chance to think about it like uh, more deeper. If this is something uh, they are willing to go through and it can help us to filter actually the candidates with uh, which are like, okay, I'm, I'm aware that uh, something can happen and uh, it's fine, you know, and there might be people who say, okay, I, I don't want any, any trouble. So uh, I will maybe go for another project in, in Europe or something. Uh, also, uh, we should give them like in writing some important uh, thing like uh, phone list and some important instructions in writing because when you just say it orally, then uh, it might disappear in their head, but to have something in writing. And yeah, to keep regular communication, it doesn't have to be the Georgian style like uh, every day, uh, three times a day. But perhaps I have experience from my previous colleagues uh, from the Euro Asia one that at the beginning they were in touch with the volunteer really every day because there were some uh, issues. So to be ready for that. And uh, also we are mentioning that uh, you might go for a vacation or something so that your other colleagues in the organization, they are trained well, they know what to do if something happens. Yeah, so it doesn't depend only on one person because you might be sick, you might go on holiday or something like this. So there's always someone to step in and they have uh, knowledge about the project and what needs to be done. Thank Let's... you, Mishka. Anyone else want something? I think uh, Elish managed pretty well to summarize everything we discussed. So I think it's okay actually for our side. Okay then, thank you all. So next, so you're seeing the PowerPoint present presentation again, yes? Yes. So the next chapter is um, presentation or stories based on real cases that happened uh, that occur some kind of a crisis problem issue. Uh, so we will share first, we as a Mladi Info we will share a few stories from our site and later, uh, uh, all partners can share it because they have some <laughs> interesting story to, to, to share. So, uh, Anita, it's okay for uh, for you to start me to start with the stories and to you to continue later. Sure. Yes. So basically, 
Uh, I will start with the first story that we have from the volunteers that volunteer that we had in Cambodia three years ago in the first edition of this project. So um, we picked the volunteer. Actually, we didn't pick. We recommended this volunteer. We had like interviews with a couple of uh, volunteers. Uh, we um, sent uh, three CVs, I believe, to the uh, partners in Cambodia, and we recommended only one. So the girl actually who went. So the Cambodian partner also selected that one. And we had the pre-departure training, a meeting with the volunteer. She was overly excited. She was like, she was really well-educated with very good English skills. Uh, she was very willing to travel, like to experience new things. So everything was okay. Maybe when I'm going back now, uh, maybe we didn't notice that that over-excitement maybe was also, it had some dose of anxiety in it. So basically the thing also that we didn't know is that her mother passed away a couple of months ago. So the volunteer went to Cambodia and I believe that after the first week, uh, the problems started. So basically me, one colleague uh, from Mladi Info International also, and uh, in some parts, even I was also involved. Uh, so basically the, the girl started to have anxiety attacks, panic attacks, uh, on the other side, it was very, how to say, unpredictable. She, she was having panic attacks, uh, but on the other side, she went driving a motorcycle for the first time. So the same time she was challenging somehow to do some different stuff, dangerous stuff, I would say, or stuff that you won't do it when you're on a two months in Asia. Uh, but on the other side, she was frightened from, from all of it. So she was afraid, what if something bad happened to her? What if something, I don't know, some kind of illness? Um, she was constantly complaining on the hygiene of the, I don't know, accommodation, restaurants, etc. But at the same time, she traveled in between the towns and between the cities of Cambodia. So what we decided in the first couple of weeks, we were constant support, like uh, literally every day. How are you? She will write us. Um, I'm not fine. I will book a, a ticket to come home. And we tried at least maybe two weeks, two and a half weeks uh, to keep her sanity. Like uh, you're fine, you're gonna be okay. You just need time to adapt really. But after two, three weeks, we really decide that we cannot push her or uh, how to say to make her to stay there. So she know what is what, what was in the agreement said. Um, and I believe that when, when we gave her the freedom, like, uh, okay, it's up to you, really it's up to you. Either you're coming back, either you're gonna stay there, face all of your fears, face all of your panics. We'll try to support you as much as we can. It is very important that the Cambodian partner somehow couldn't find a way, let's say, to provide her um, some kind of a psychological assistance or psychological uh, help. Uh, I mean, that was not even part of the agreement, but however, uh, and um, we, tried, we tried really to make best of, best of us and to, to, to advise her uh, in the best possible way. Uh, however, uh, when we tell her, okay, it's up to you. You can come back anytime you like. You can stay, have very good experience, try to manage all of your challenges that you're feeling right now. Uh, try to make connections with volunteers, with uh, friends there. So she, even even it was very difficult, she decided to stay. So she stayed through the whole service. Um, through the whole service, we were like constant support, psychological, every kind of support. So um, at the end, uh, she was really proud that she she managed to handle and managed to face the fears, managed to overcome those situations and to uh, to come back uh, home. And probably I believe that we received from, from the best possible feedback and evaluation from all of the volunteers actually that we have sent it in Eurasia uh, in the first edition. Um, so this is... Um, this is one problem. I mean, none of us is trained how to treat this kind of, a, let's say, mental health issues. 
maybe I had some experience myself back in the uh, years at the university with some uh, anxiety, but that is again, that is my uh, personal experience. And I was giving her advices based on my personal experience. So uh, I believe that each, let's say, uh, coordinator or program manager uh, from the same organization should have some kind of a, let's say, it doesn't have to be a, a psychological, I don't know, with a diploma, but should have some kind of a skills or to have training for this kind of a situation. Because uh, anxiety is anxiety, depression, big depression is depression. So you really cannot handle and you really cannot know how to manage those stuff. Uh, the other story uh, is um, from Info when we hosted one volunteer. Uh, this is a story that my colleagues told me, so I wasn't in London for that time. Uh, when uh, sometimes we're giving highly responsible tasks to the volunteers. So Mladi Info, I don't know how many of the partners know, is running a very big educational opportunity website that is running almost, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And the volunteer came. He had some kind of an IT background and actually he was studying in Macedonia IT technology something. And... Uh, the colleagues uh, that were in the web department then um, gave her gave him like full access to do some kind of a changes changes on the website, and he started to install some kind of a plugins on the WordPress, etc. So the whole website was I don't know how long, two one week. So it was a huge huge problem. Uh, we needed, they needed to contact the web administrator, they needed to contact the web server, uh, the people to, to, to revise all the stuff. To, so basically the, the website was down like uh, two weeks, I believe. So this is something uh, very also important to consider what kind of a task you're giving to the volunteers. So uh, is it a task that is really important to you that you don't wanna mess up or end up like something to be broken or to, to fix it later? So uh, it is very important to uh, to give um, a not so highly uh, responsible test, in my opinion. Yeah. Rosita, if I can add here, I mean, yeah. this is a situation where um, actually the organization was in crisis because we overstepped with the responsibilities of the volunteer. And uh, just to, 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 I mean, it doesn't look like a crisis uh, when, when, um, when we talk like this. But if you have in mind that the website for us is like a revenue stream from one hand, and from the other hand, we have 1 million visits per year. Uh, we have 120,000 fans and followers on Facebook. You can see that, for example, the whole brand of Mladi Info at the beginning was relying on that website because we started as an educational yeah. platform. Uh, so if that, uh, for example, if the website uh, you know, crashes or the website was taken over, uh, but somebody else, the organization would lose a lot of, lot of um, money, reputation, and a lot of, uh, you know, um, time invested in the last 10, 12 years. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, another situation, how the organization can have a potential crisis from the action of the volunteer, not only the volunteer uh, itself. So Yes, at the time, I believe that they were also delivering campaigns for marketing clients. So we had some kind of responsibility also in front of the marketing clients why their campaigns are not delivered during this whole week why the website is crashed so uh it is very very important to 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 know what what kind of tests to to give to the volunteers rosica uh, uh rosica rosica whatever you like <laughs> rosica, rosita, yeah. <laughs> okay sorry um what i i understand that from the the second um story you were not working at the time so maybe you don't have all the information but what i'm interested in those um four stories is uh, what can we learn from this so the first one uh, we 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 also have examples uh, of course more you work in that field more you have examples um, i can uh, sorry to interrupt i can say yeah. yes i can conclude that from the first story uh first uh we need to have some kind of a form to check the volunteer before going so to ask them question related to mental health, so maybe because uh, we are because we are here to discuss and it's yeah. a very difficult subject. I I'm not sure about that. I mean, there's no way we can we 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 ask for a medical certificate 
and this is the least we can do to see if they're in shape and they have the vaccine. And I'm not talking about the COVID vaccine, yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, you I know, know, every vaccine. But um, apart from that, and apart from all the discussion, um, I mean, we, we, how how many questionnaire you can you can think of? No, no, no. Of course that you prevent... cannot prevent anything. Yeah, even the if the people is perfectly healthy, maybe when they end up in those end up alone in the yeah, I don't and... know, different reality problems may occur. But yeah. uh, from what we learned, that at least we can include some kind of a questions because uh, in the first condition we didn't have, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to invest or we need to have some people who will be trained to give advices to the volunteers in this kind of situation. I agree. And, and if any one of you um, have any name or contact, we are highly looking for that because we're thinking about active listening or things like that. But, you know, we're not psycholog um, we're not professional in the yes. psychological yes. field and we, we're not meant to do. It's, a, it's another job. Um, and the, the, you have insurance for that who can also provide psychological support but still we need as as manager as coordinator we need some basis to to listen carefully our volunteers and to know how you know what uh, sometimes our reaction can be as hurtful as mm -hmm. the situation the volunteers is living so you know and not not everyone knows what to do in those situation so yes if you have any 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 good training uh, in that field uh, we would be really highly interested, um, and uh, and and I wanted to ask you about so about the second mm -hmm. um, uh, testimonial. Um, <laughs> we always have like a good balance between because we want to give them responsibility and they want to be involved. And after six, nine, ten months, that they they want to be more involved. But um, so how do you set the limits? Like this is too much responsibility uh, for you. Yes, I would say that uh, we can give them the responsibilities uh, uh, for this situation. For example, he was working on the website. So basically we can give them a task uh, that is connect connected directly to the website. So he can add some kind of a post, some kind of articles to the website but he cannot have the access to the admin of the WordPress website. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the WordPress managing of the website. So basically you can have roles, you can be editor, you can be admin. So uh, I wouldn't in this situation when we are operating a website where uh, from where we are generating revenue, as Marian said, so basically where we have marketing clients, I wouldn't give like highly responsible tasks to the volunteer. I wouldn't go on a vacation and leave to be run by volunteers so basically uh, I will coordinate I will monitor all of the uh, all of the uh, all of the operations that are uh, done on the website but again this kind of responsible task like operating the whole website I wouldn't give them so I will give them an editor access so they can create posts they can upload pictures they can upload I don't know documents they can create content they can create content for the uh, social media but Again, I believe that for this situation, uh, uh, only the, the the very skilled person who knows really like the web administrator or the web manager of the team should have access to. Yeah. So and the learning the thing, from this, it was really not to give like uh, a task that you don't want to be messed up with, like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, it's like sorry. Um, so Daniel, just one sentence. Yeah. I think our mistake here uh, was that for this position, we have a, sp uh, a person who is hired to do this, right? So we have, uh, you have, you know, we have a guy who is maintaining all of it. And we just gave an additional access to the volunteer who thought that he knew what he was doing. But in the end, he, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't know. So that was our mistake, like being, uh, you know, too open, like to explore uh, something which is really important. Because I mentioned, as Mr. Rosita mentioned, like, uh, from from the front side is fine if they have access they can you know they can make a mistake with a post or article or whatever but if you give them access from the background that means that you know they can that that then can have a consequence to the entire website as as we mentioned so that was the the mistake. Mm. <clears throat> Daniela, do you want to add something, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to say that we were 
very often um, challenging ourselves with, uh, with this uh, topic, like um, the limit between giving uh, independence to the volunteers and at the same time to be prepared to uh, to know that the final responsibility of what is published or what happens is always ours. So uh, one of the practice that we use is that we give a, a little bit of, of independence, but at the end there is always a, a, a supervision process. So before anything gets published on our blog, on our website, on our YouTube channel, there is always a check done by two different people. So the first person who is the tutor of the volunteers, so who uh, at least check that the basic standards are uh, fulfilled. And then there is a second person that is double checking and uh, analyze if uh, the product that we want to deliver uh, is following all the criteria that they should follow. Because it's, um, I mean, our own personal and NGO uh, reputation is, uh, is on the stake. So it's, it's very important that we have this kind of double check. And for us, this is a process that, that, that works. Of course, it takes a lot, of, a lot of time. Of course, it's slow, the procedures a lot, but it, it prevents a lot of problems or, or, uh, or issues. So it's always better be safe than sorry. That's the general message I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. So, Anita, you want to continue? So, Anita yeah. will continue with uh, two more stories, and later you can say if you have some similar story to share, if you had some story that is on a different topic. So, Anita, please go on. And uh... Thank you, Rosita. Uh, I will present first my experience, the fourth uh, example here, my experience in Spain. So, I, as I mentioned, I was CVS volunteers 13 years ago in Spain. And uh, in that period, um, we were still not in the Schengen uh, visa uh, regulations. Uh, so we, I had uh, to issue a visa from the Spanish embassy in uh, Spain. And they gave me a visa for three months, uh, telling that uh, I have to, when I go to Spain, I have to go to the police uh, and extend it uh, for the duration of 10 months that I was there. So uh, everything was mentioned to my coordinating organization and my host organization because I had coordinating and host organization in the same time. Uh, they knew everything. So uh, the time was passing and they were not doing anything. Uh, those three months from my visa period passed and I was telling all the time to my coordinator, uh, what are we doing? Are we going to the police? Uh, because I will be deported from Spain. And they were telling me all the time, but you're in Spain, don't worry, nobody will do anything to you. Yes, but I'm from Macedonia. <laughs> and uh, I'm a stranger here, so everything can happen to me and I can be deported. Uh, at uh, the end of the fifth month, two months, I was illegal in Spain. <laughs> um, at the end of the fifth month, I finally convinced, convinced them to go to the police and um, start uh, the procedure for continuing the visa. So, uh, and uh, my residence, uh, regulating my residence in, uh, in Spain. So it was finalized without any problems, but uh, uh, be careful uh, when uh, there is this kind of uh, legal uh, stay issues. Uh, with the volunteers, uh, the first thing that has to be on your mind into, is to regulate uh, this kind of, uh, of issues. Because uh, even uh, if the country is uh, very open and friendly, etc., it's not always the case with the strangers who are coming from another countries. And uh, mm, the politics between the countries uh, is... Um, uh, mm, Pro not problematic, but uh, has to be re regulated on legal uh, way. So uh, uh, this is uh, one of uh, the cases. So Cuba, oh, Dios mio, Cuba, <laughs> the experience of my lifetime. Uh, so uh, I had this volunteer from Cuba and uh, he had to come in February 
in uh, Macedonia. Uh, it was a uh, very cold winter here in Macedonia. And before coming, I told him, uh, you have to wear warm clothes. Here is minus, uh, minus 10, minus 12. Uh, you have to wear a uh, jacket. I don't know what else. And he came with a summer jacket. Uh, no problem. Uh, my brother gave him everything, uh, his clothes, and he was warm. Uh, and the problem, the problem started after the 15th day. He started with the panic attacks. He was, uh, when walking together, he was all the time looking for policemen uh, to, uh, to check if he's safe. Um, I don't know his experience uh, from, from Cuba, but um, he was afraid that someone will do something to him. I was explaining to him that uh, nobody will do anything that, uh, um, if he, if he has uh, some kind of problem with someone, he can call me anytime. Uh, but from the experience with the other vol volunteers, uh, nobody from uh, the local community done anything to anyone. Uh, and after the, the 15th day, a police called me and said, okay, here is one guy uh, telling that you are his mentor. I said, okay. What is he saying? He's, they said, uh, we don't under, uh, understand him because he didn't speak English. We don't uh, understand him, but uh, he's shaking all the time. He's having a panic attack. Uh, can we please come to your home and see what's the problem? Can you translate to us what he's saying? I said, okay, no problem. Can, uh, and I said, can you pass him uh, on the phone? The policeman said, okay, I asked him what the problem is. He said, somebody came to my apartment and drove um, the cigars, the cigars. I said, it's impossible that someone uh, came for the cigars, but okay, we will check that. Uh, then he came with the police at my home and um, he, he didn't uh, Top to having a pa panic attack. We went to his apartment and uh, the, um, the cigars were there. Everything was there. Nobody came uh, in his apartment to rob him. Uh, he was just uh, inventing those things. Uh, and um, the policeman said, uh, this, is, uh, this will be uh, the only time that we are not going to charge you because of the false um, uh, false, false, alarm. False, false alarm. But the next time you do this, we will charge you and uh, you will have to stay for one night in the police. And uh, I said uh, to him, okay. Uh, he said he's afraid to stay alone because someone will enter and uh, will do something to him. And I said, okay, you will come to my apartment and you will stay with me. Uh, so he came, uh, he was uh, all the time stressed. Uh, he didn't eat for days because, uh, because of his panic attacks, he didn't like the, the food. Uh, I don't know. And um, I spoke with his host or uh, his uh, sending organization. Uh, ah, sorry, I, I forgot to, to, to say that uh, he met the policeman again and told him again that he has a problems with me and I don't know what else. Uh, so the policeman called me and said, I, con uh, I um, uh, counsel you to uh, quit his uh, contract and send him home because he's having uh, a lot of uh, problems. I contacted his uh, sending organization and his family uh, asking for his family if he was having uh, any uh, psychological problems before. They said not. Uh, Probably it was about the because of the shock uh, uh, moving from Cuba to Macedonia. I don't know, but anyways, I uh, stopped uh, his contract and uh, we changed uh, his uh, airplane ticket and uh, he left uh, to Skopje to take the airplane.
he called me from the airport and saying that he missed the flight. <laughs> yeah, he missed the flight. Um, after uh, I said, uh, okay, I will buy you another ticket for another day. Stay in Skopje, find a hotel. Please find a hotel. I will buy you another ticket uh, to go home. Uh, after that, a girl from Skopje called me and he said, some girl from the street uh, and said, uh, here is the guy uh, from Cuba uh, saying that uh, he left uh, his uh, things, uh, his uh, luggage in the hotel, but he can't find the hotel now. Uh, uh, I uh, asked uh, asked for the location and called my friend uh, to go after him to find him. He went there, he couldn't find him. He was uh, circulating with his motorbike around Skopje to find him and he couldn't find him. <laughs> and uh, I called the hotel. They said that uh, he didn't come for the night. He, he probably slept on the street, I don't know. And the other day I went uh, to Skopje. Uh, I took him back to Struga and uh, bought another ticket for airplane and said, okay, you're staying for three days after uh, be, uh, before the flight. I will leave you at the airport and uh, uh, you can uh, go back uh, safely. Ah, sorry, I forgot to tell uh, before, before that, before going to take him, uh, he um, went uh, to the border to Serbia. He wanted to go to Serbia. And uh, the uh, uh, officer there from the border called me and said, uh, here is one guy from Cuba uh, uh, wanting to go to Serbia, the Macedonian border, uh, let him uh, go in Serbia, but we can't let him uh, go. So now he's uh, staying in the Macedonian border. And I say uh, to him, please do not uh, mm, uh, let him go anywhere else i am coming immediately to take him i go to the border he's not there and the officer tells me that uh, he left with a taxi to another city kumanovo uh the taxi driver calls me uh, and says uh, that uh, they are going to kumanovo and i said <laughs> to taxi driver, please come here. I'm waiting you on this uh, gas station uh, and uh, you're going to give him to me <laughs> and I'm going back to Struga. So he stayed for three days uh, in Struga until I uh, went to the airport together with him and be sure that he enters to the airplane. When we went to the uh, airport, everybody there knew him. Ah, hello, how are you? <laughs> he was friend with everybody. He was sleeping at the airport. He booked hotel and he was sleeping at, at the airport. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the officers there told me I was going to kill him. He was shaking here. He was having panic attacks. He was uh, in, um, uh, interrupting and... Uh, Mm, arguing with the uh, with the other passengers and uh, after that a policeman uh, left him to the hotel so it was quite an adventure so I went to the uh, I left him at the airport and I was waiting there till, till the airplane fl <laughs> flight so, so I will be sure that he will uh, go back to Cuba safely and it was an adventure that I will never forget in my life. Uh, so be prepared that something like this uh, can happen uh, to every host organization. Uh, it can be produced by uh, a shock, uh, cultural shock, or it can be produced by uh, uh, 
medical conditions like uh, uh, depression, like panic attacks, uh, anxiety, etc. But uh, be prepared to uh, react immediately. Thank you, Ani. Thank you, Anita. So, uh, guys, we'll have again 15 minutes, break, but in the meantime, during the break, think about if you have some similar story to share or some crisis that occurred, so, so you're going to tell us. Um, so, uh, 11.40 is okay with you. 15 minutes will be the break, I believe. We'll meet yes, at 11.40 and we'll continue with the uh, story share if some of you has. And uh, again, we have some Jamboard uh, group work and the final chapter for presentation. So 11.40, see you again. See you, you guys. I see the Dutch case really exhausted. She yeah. needs to take a break. <laughs> I, I can... how there is involved some crisis how you resolve it and etc so um i can share a quick one and um it might be interesting because it's a different one so um i'm sorry i couldn't think about a story in in the balkan or in in asia um but it it happened with a partner um in india and so it was bef just before I arrived, but I had to manage the crisis with my with my manager. So we had two volunteers with a good partner in India, and it was um, from what we know it was going well. Um, but at the result, they were not happy with the task they were given, and they felt a lack of supervision from their mentor. Um, so basically they felt um, alone and with no recognition of their work. Um, and uh, apparently they tried to warn us, but we, we, we didn't give them an answer that was satisfied for them. Um, and the, men, the, the host organization didn't improve their, their management. So what we should, we should have done is to say, okay, if um, the situation won't improve and if you cannot, uh, if you're not okay with the situation, then we should um, finish this volunteering uh, because our partner won't, won't say well done uh, every day to you. And uh, unfortunately, that's how the, the culture is done here with, uh, with the, the management is done with the, this partner. So, um, we're sorry, that's not what you expected as a volunteer, but so if you're not okay with that, we, we will finish that. Um, it's not what we have decided at the time. We decided, okay, so basically get over it and continue to do your best. You do that for you and for the beneficiaries, not to um, impress anyone. So they, both volunteers, they went to the end of their volunteering, but then they did a report to the um, local uh, French, uh, uh, it's it's not the embassy. It's called French, uh, France Volontaire, uh, but they have the same authority as an embassy, and um, they have. Um, okay, so basically, for, for us, it's a very important institution uh, that we need to 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 deal with, um, and so we we went to send two new volunteers and. Before sending other volunteers, we had a chat with the host organizations saying this was not going well. So this might be the last volunteer that we're sending you. Please um, be more attention. So how that's how we deal with this. We didn't know it was going to be a crisis, but what we managed. Um, and those two volunteers, it was going great. Our host uh, organization was... Uh, they, they improved their attitude a lot and not a lot, a lot, <laughs> but it was enough for the volunteers who were there. Um, but in the meantime, the report went to the embassy and the France Volontaire and blah, blah, blah. So we lost the, um, you know, like, like the quality label for that organization. And they didn't say, okay, those volunteers, they can, they can finish their volunteering and then it's done. Um, we were afraid that they would send those volunteers home, even though they were saying it was going well and they, they have a, a really good impact. 
So um, what we learned from this situation is that, you know, local reputation is really important for, for uh, our organization, but for the host organization as well, uh, because they cannot host volunteers anymore on this label. Um, it's not the ESC label, but it's the civic service label. So it's another volunteering in, in, in France. Um, so now what we do is that we, we, before sending any new volunteers, we check with this local institution every time, every time, because it, it's a lot of work to manage those kind of crisis. And, you know, with the visa and everything for the volunteers, uh, we wouldn't take the risk that suddenly they realize, oh, no, this host organization um, shouldn't host anymore. So um, even though it's, it's a lot of work to um, every, you know, six months or every time we send new volunteers everywhere, we, we check this organiz uh, with this institution. Oh, so, and now some of them, they, they don't reply to our emails, but at least, you know, we, we feel safe. And others, they say, oh, that's great. There are others volunteers in the same topic or uh, great. I will host them as a French, you know, cultural event that we organize. So, you know, it has improved our relationship also with those institutions. Um, so, yes, if you have that, um, what we learned from that is um, maybe improve our relationship with those uh, local institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Anyone else, maybe from the Asian partners, wants to share a um, story? If, they, if you have one. If not, yet, we can continue, however, with the presentation. Uh, so, No volunteer for sharing stories. Okay, so I don't think uh, the, okay. So the next question is um, uh, okay. We already discussed this part, so maybe um, you can put few stickers or uh, ideas. Uh, what is a good response to a crisis for you, for particularly for this type of project? For example, immediately contact the sending organization. Uh, I don't know, some like contact this institution, improve the communication between in, between this institution. So what do you think that are, uh, uh, yes, quick reaction, quick response. So uh, please put a few stickers. Yeah, keep calm. I would like to ask for this, uh, for this, be sure that you have a background written evidence of the situation. Uh, is it to keep track, for example, via email for the situation? I, I don't know. I'm not sure if I completely understand. Yeah, uh, it was me. So uh, as um, very, very often, I mean, it, it might happen that the crisis situation is involving the hosting organization or the, how, how the situation is uh, dealt. Um, so basically, if the volunteer complains, so if it's a crisis or if the volunteer complains for a certain situation, it's always good to have a written evidence. So uh, exchange communication, try to get a written report from the, the volunteer, from people around the volunteer, from the hosting organization or from the general situation so that in case you have to explain why the situation happened, you have some background material. So it's not only a spoken word, it's not only uh, somebody said that, but you are based on practical evidence. So you cannot be attacked, let's say. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for explaining. So we can continue. You can come back later to this uh, slide if you want to add a few more things if they come up to your mind later. So uh, we can continue with the presentation. So now is the sixth chapter for actually the plan for the crisis management. Uh, Anita will continue. And this is the last chapter. So we have the presentation of Anita and uh, later one more Jamboard slide to contribute and to discuss. Anita, you can go 
start. Okay. Um, I'm trying to send you here a file, but it says network network disconnected. I will try again, so you can have it in front of you while I explain. Um, what do you mean? What kind of this file that we are actually seeing, or another one? No, another one. Okay. Yeah, she will share another one. While Anita is uh, doing that, I can. Um, Maybe you can take it from here. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, everything that uh, Rosita and Marian mentioned uh, before now. It's good to be structured uh, and uh, pointed out in um, some kind of um, crisis management plan, action plan, or, or depending how you will call it. So you will define there the uh, crisis management and what uh, kind of crisis uh, uh, are you going uh, potential crisis you will face uh, during the volunteer stay and during the partnership with the uh, sending or hosting organization. Uh, so uh, if you open here the, the document uh, in the Google Drive, you will see what kind of uh, risk analysis uh, we make uh, in our organization. Um, and we make this uh, not only for the uh, volunteers project, but also for uh, our regular job. And um, you can see that uh, you can uh, identify first uh, the field sector or act actor, uh, depending if it's a hosting organization, sending organization, coordinating organization, or volunteer, um, maybe environment uh, or something else. So, and depending on the if uh, it's about the voluntary, you will, you will identify a risk. A risk, for uh, example, uh, panic attacks or depression, and uh, what is the potential negative behavior uh, wanting to go in Serbia, for example, or uh, calling the police or inventing uh, things, uh, etc. And uh, when you define the potential negative behavior, you will uh, um, uh, define how it will influence uh, the project, how it will influence the result, the, the impact of the project. Um, if it's uh, something uh, very um, big uh, uh, issue or you can solve it um, immediately. And uh, after that, you will define the potential solutions. So uh, we will do this, 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 this. Uh, for You can add uh, uh, how many you want potential solutions that uh, you think uh, it will serve for uh, uh, um, resolving that, uh, that issue. And very important, uh, I also mentioned before when we were working in groups, uh, we are um, identifying responsible persons. Uh, we are not uh, just writing mentor uh, here or coordinator, but we write with uh, name and surname. Uh, we don't write a uh, host organization, coordinating organization, or sending organization. Because if you write uh, hosting organization, uh, that means that all the empl uh, employees in the hosting organization are responsible for that. That means that uh, if everybody is responsible, then nobody is responsible uh, to solve that problem. So that's why I suggest you put names. Anita Gagoska will solve uh, this uh, this problem. Is uh, responsible for that this one. The mentor Stefan is responsible for that one. Uh, and uh, after uh, that, you uh, point out the desired desired status. So. Uh, what is the desired solution? Now, what uh, is uh, the optimal um, problem solved uh, um, uh, status? And uh, some notes uh, if you have something uh, to add. So uh, that is how you will um, um, 
analyze all the risks, all the crises, uh, but all, oops, Rosita, all the potential crises uh, that are going to occur during uh, the volunteer stay and during the project duration. Um, it is very important that uh, in the uh, construction of this uh, risk analysis, all the stuff that are uh, um, related uh, somehow uh, with the volunteer are included and all of them contribute. So uh, before that, they will be educated uh, in some kind of uh, this kind of uh, trainings or you will organize uh, uh, organizational uh, meetings that are going that where you will explain to the staff uh, what means uh, uh, European Voluntary Service or um, uh, how they have to treat uh, the volunteer uh, uh, when they have to um, uh, when they have to uh, um, inform you if uh, they notice uh, some kind of different. Uh, behavior with the volunteer, uh, etc. So um, that's how uh, you will have, um, uh, you will be prepared for uh, prevention and anticipation and not ad hoc uh, solution of uh, any problem, problem occurred. Uh, so, as Marian before mentioned, uh, the prevention and anticipation key points, uh, you will uh, mention all the uh, key points uh, that you will identify uh, in your risk analysis in the summary uh, of uh, your um, crisis management plan or action plan. Um, maybe some, uh, some key points are... Um, uh important for italy but uh, they are not uh, um, practical for macedonia uh so uh, your organization knows uh, the best uh, how uh, to react uh, in uh, this kind of situation and also uh, when uh, we say uh, when we talk about the reactions it's not only the stuff uh, that you mentioned in the uh, risk analysis form, but also for, uh, when I mentioned uh, responsible persons, not only the staff that uh, work in your organization, but also uh, you can mention their um, number of hospital, um, uh, police, uh, or um, for example, in Macedonia, the primary uh, medicine uh, is uh, private. So we all have a private uh, doctor and uh, we contact, for example, my doctor and say to her, um, we are going to have volunteers for the period of uh, one year. Um, do you agree that uh, we put you in our um, uh, plan that you will be the contact doctor for our volunteer so he can uh, come to you whenever he has uh, problems to not uh, um, uh, put uh, the volunteer in situation uh, to look after doctors around the town and around the, town? the city uh, to be just one contact uh, that uh, he's going to uh, to have on mind At also Anita? for the dentist yes and i'm sorry you're talking about your own private doctor not the, like a doctor from your organization you're talking about no your... it's a yeah, personal gp that's a personal yeah. general pediatrician how you say it in France. okay I don't know. Yeah. okay so this is like kind of a like a, f a favor you're asking him or her to to be the contact for the volunteer uh it's it's not favor he's having an insurance and uh, we are just giving him the contact of uh, one doctor. For example, okay. so, so, so doctor, just someone so you trust. You go to okay. There's uh, no agreement between you. Okay, okay. I understand. Uh, in case it's emergency, then you call uh, emergency. You don't uh, contact the uh, private uh, doctor. Um, uh, also for for the police, you give uh, like uh, Cyrilly uh, sent uh, the the form that uh, they give uh, to uh, to the volunteers. You can uh, write all the um, 
um, numbers uh, for emergency that uh, the volunteer uh, can call when uh, an emergency uh, occurs. Not uh, 24 hours we are with him or her, so not always we will be reliable to go immediately. And um, as, as Marian mentioned, be his family uh, here. Uh, sometimes uh, he has to do it by uh, by himself. Um, uh, you will uh, put all those uh, information in uh, that uh, that document that uh, you are going uh, to uh, to create. Uh, Also, uh, it is uh, good, uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, all the stuff in the, uh, in, uh, the organization where he will work uh, to uh, have his number and uh, he has uh, their number uh, in order if someone is uh, not available in the, in the moment, uh, uh, he calls another uh, person from uh, the organization uh, if something uh, occurs. Uh, if we make uh, this kind of uh, risk analysis, so we will be prepared uh, for unexpected uh, um, situation and uh, we will uh, react um, properly. Uh, if um, we think that everything will be okay and nothing will happen, then uh, we will don't know how to react and uh, we will not be prepared. Uh, we will... Uh, act uh, uh, confused and uh, in panic and try uh, to fix it uh, <laughs> like uh, we can uh, immediately. But um, to not uh, uh, come to a situation like uh, calling the police or, or et cetera, uh, it's good to prevent than to heal, uh, as, uh, as uh, someone said. Mm. Uh, I believe that uh, Rosica will send uh, uh, the the document that uh, we had. Rosica, this one, the risk analysis. No, the risk analysis. I send it uh, here uh, in Which the document? chat. And uh, the document that we're gonna develop after the. Yes. 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 I mean, it will be an open open document. So basically, what we are trying with this chapter is. Um, to propose, this is our proposal of uh, uh, points, what we think that it should be included in the uh, plan for crisis. Uh, so basically uh, we will uh, make the draft version of the document, we will share it with you and all of the partners will be able to make fine tuning and to add a few more things that they consider that are important to the plan and actually to have one document that we can, as, as I mentioned previously, to have a reference document uh, for maybe a certain situation because you cannot plan or anticipate every situation, but for most of the situations that, that, that can occur, uh, to have some kind of a guidance what to do. So yes, I will share it with you as soon as we make the first draft of the, of the document, of the plan. Uh, usually for the long stay period of the volunteer, we um, include him in um, a tool that we use uh, in our organization for, um, it's called case uh, study, uh, case clinic. I will send you the link uh, how the, the procedure is, uh, is made. Usually uh, this uh, lasts for about, um, half uh, uh, hour and a half and it's a teamwork you can see the procedure here so um, we used to uh, do it in our organization uh, once a week before the covid crisis and uh, when uh, it's a, a tool um, it's a psychological tool that we use uh, where uh, one uh, person uh, has um, um, opportunity to um, present uh, one problem that uh, it's uh, bothering him, that uh, he's struggling with, 
and um, the others are uh, listeners. Uh, one is a case giver, uh, the others are listeners. They are not giving him um, uh, con uh, concrete uh, uh, solutions and uh, uh, counsels, but uh, they are just listening him and um, uh, pointing some uh, something on uh, uh, paper. Uh, after the presentation of the problem, um, they are just asking him questions uh, after the 15 minutes of, uh, of presentation. They're asking him questions. Uh, what do you think, um, uh, for example, what do you think if um, would happen if you have done this? What do you think? It's not uh, why you didn't this, uh, di done this. Do, do you understand? So uh, it is important in this um, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, tool uh, to have uh, generative dialogue uh, uh, later. Uh, you all reflect, uh, uh, and uh, the case giver from your questions, he's reflecting and uh, he's finding his own solutions uh, of uh, some of the problems. Uh, it's not always that we have the the best uh, the best solutions for a problem, but he's uh, uh, finding him. We are like a um, some kind of uh, coaches uh, without uh, giving him instructions. You have to do this or that. Um, in uh, with uh, this uh, with this tool, uh, not only that um, uh, he's. Uh, he will solve his problem, but uh, if he uh, contributes uh, to uh, uh, weekly uh, sessions like this with other colleagues, uh, he will uh, develop trust with his colleagues. Uh, he will um, uh, become a functional part of the team and he will uh, try to be a, a functional team player in the organization. He will not uh, feel like a stranger came uh, uh, from uh, somewhere and uh, doing just uh, uh, five uh, uh, months uh, job here and uh, going back, but uh, he will uh, feel that uh, he's important part of the organization. So maybe uh, uh, you can uh, try to uh, practice this uh, this tool in your organization. You have the, the instructions uh, here in the in the link. Do you have any so questions think... about the um, procedure for uh, risk analysis? Did you all open the, the file? So whoever is willing to fill the, the risk analysis document, you can fill it and send it back to us so we can include it in the draft plan that we're going to create. Um, I don't know if Ani, uh, Anita, you 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 finished, yeah. Yeah. So we can uh, basically uh, these are the seven points that we wrote that we would like to be included in the plan. However, now in the last uh, Jamboard um, slide, there is an open space for you to put a sticker. Uh, with some points that you also believe that are important to be included in the plan. So please go on the last. What do you think that we need to include additionally in the plan for Clarice's management of Eurasia project? Um, we have around 20 minutes left, so take like five minutes uh, to think about and to, to put something in the stickers. For example,
So definitely, we spoke also with Marian in uh, in our team that definitely we need to to include the COVID point. <laughs> uh, what might happen, like closing borders, etc. So uh, definitely, uh, we should have like specially dedicated one point only to that situation and how uh, how to uh, to act. What if the volunteer gets COVID? What if the volunteer is in isolation? What if the borders in Vietnam are closed and the volunteer cannot uh, come home and we don't know when he will come home? So uh, these are the situations that we really must consider because uh, even if the situation, it will become better by time, potentially the volunteers, according to the plan, should go on a service from January uh, 2022, I believe, Mishka? that we agreed that uh, they will travel in January if, uh, if, there is, uh, if there is a real possibility to do. So um, uh, we definitely need to include that as a, as something in the in this. I don't know if uh, already was spoken or not uh, for this project. Um, but it's good to be mentioned if uh, the volunteers need to be uh, vaccinated or not to travel. I believe that it will be dependent. Uh, the, the project application, I believe that Mishka is not like having mandatory, but uh, I believe that will be up to the countries how they will regulate the allowance of entry of the people from abroad. Definitely, it's not written in the application yeah. form, but as Merosica mentioned, depends on the single states. It's definitely better if someone is already vaccinated. Sure, uh, yes. With both of the dosages, because uh, otherwise, for example, for Slovakia, yeah. it's really like compulsory quarantine, having paid uh, the PCR test. And yeah, I don't think that's really nice. Yes, and also I wouldn't include that in the requirements, you know, in the open call, because it's a, some kind of a form of discrimination. Let's say if you have preferences, someone is vaccinated or not vaccinated. So, uh, you can just say maybe a recommendation. Maybe you should yeah. like yeah, yeah. Or really you can ask that, that on the interview. So yes, but uh, yeah. Um, maybe also to give them just a hint, like if you're not vaccinated and you're really thinking about getting the vaccine yeah. anyway, then maybe do it prior to the departure. Yes, so for example, many uh, many young people in Macedonia. I mean, a couple of years ago, they. Um, included the mandatory vaccine for hepatitis B. Uh, so uh, let's say that the people, the, the young people that are older than 25, I believe, actually are not vaccinated against hepatitis B because now each newborn is mandatory vaccine. They don't even ask the mothers or fathers or whatever. They put the hepatitis B. But uh, may, most of the youngsters uh, that are above 25 don't have that vaccine. So basically, a, the volunteers that traveled in Asia uh, three years ago in the first edition, uh, they needed to receive the hepatitis B uh, vaccine. So we're not only speaking for COVID vaccine. So yes, definitely. I mean, more of again, it is up to them to decide. So if they want to get the vaccine or not, but it is recommendable from our side to do it. So yeah, definitely. I think that there are some of the compulsory vaccines if you travel to some countries. So yeah, definitely yeah. something to uh keep in the call for volunteers to write it there i see that we have already a lot of ideas there and yes. we can check them yes so uh having numbers of local hospitals insuring companies emergency contacts from the family from the people in charge of the project um clear, clear division of the uh, responsibilities yes so uh, the sending and hosting partners uh, responsibilities um, to have at least three expected crises and step-by-step -step procedure, yes, step-by-step -step guidance for certain situations that are like most probably that will ha that can happen. And uh, important places in the area, hospital, yeah. Okay, so thank you guys. We will include this and uh, more uh, more uh, additional points uh, plus the ones that we already mentioned in the power print. PowerPoint presentation. So this is actually, this was actually the last, last uh, uh, 
work and last thing to present from our side. Uh, I can uh, just shortly wrap up that yes, as soon as we have the draft plan uh, create, we will share it with you. Probably after the holidays, let's say in the late August uh, or beginning of September. So we can share the draft plan uh, of crisis management uh, then. Uh, you will be able to, to co-create it, to finish it, and to have it as a, some kind of a product, uh, let's say, uh, when the volunteering services of the volunteers will start in Asia and in Europe. 